in the few minutes that I have, I wanted to communicate something in addition to my experience as an undergraduate at the University of California, which is why I chose to stay in astronomy, and also a sense of the vision that I have for creating an academic culture in which all young scientists can thrive. I'm 31 years old today. I oh my was, gosh. I mean, today in this, in this day. In this oh, okay. <laughs> That's <laughs> actually next Sunday. <laughs> uh, I'm 31 uh, years old, and I was 20 in 2005 uh, when I was an undergraduate at Berkeley. I had just declared my major in astrophysics, and I did not grow up knowing that I wanted to be an astronomer. It was something that I had to discover about myself, and I discovered it as a freshman at UC Berkeley. I was in a class for non-majors, and the professor showed an image of outer space that I will never forget because at that moment I had, as much as any human being I think can have, a sense for the magnificence and the scale of the universe. And yet, like most young women, and I'm quoting here from the National Academy of Science Beyond Bias and Barriers study, who chose to, who choose to go on and receive advanced degrees in STEM, I did not do so because I thought I was good at it or because I thought that I could make a meaningful contribution, or because I thought it would result in financial gain for myself. In contrast, these are reasons why my male peers tend to report that they pursue advanced degrees in STEM. Rather, I did it because someone who was close to me encouraged me to. And women uh, who pursue STEM fields, they overwhelmingly cite that as the top reason they do so. I had to actually be told by um, the Letters and Science Advisor at Berkeley that my experiences, which included looking forward to doing my homework, not missing a single class, printing out star charts to look at outside of my dorm. That meant something. That was what she said it was supposed to feel like when you find the thing you should try to do with your life. And I had misgivings. My parents remember me fretting and fretting about whether I would do well in those classes, and I received A's in math, A's in physics, A's in astronomy. And I want to emphasize that the University of California, Berkeley, trained me extremely well. I use that knowledge every day in my work as an astrophysicist at MIT, and yet my experiences there were not uniformly positive. I also uh, was sexually harassed uh, at the University of California in, in a pattern that started with encouragement and ended with physical contact and sexual conversations. Let me try to convey to you what it's like on the ground as a very young woman scientist, very, very junior. Um, this was the first time that I had a very senior individual telling me not only that my passion was evident in my work, but that I was good at it. And when things escalated to the point of physical contact in his car, and believe me, how stupid I thought I was, for many years, for getting into his car, um, I remember thinking, I'm going to have to confront him. Now, here's what happened. My, um, my best friend was also an astrophysicist at the time. And between the two of us, we worried about what was happening with this professor. And I said to her, if I confront him and things go badly, you should still ask him for that letter of recommendation. Because we both knew that that letter of recommendation could mean getting into the graduate school. It could mean the internship. That could be your ticket to become a real astronomer. And that's what it's like to be a young woman on the ground. You're trying to build, in fits and starts, a science culture in which you can succeed. It's You're full of hope, but you also have a very bitter taste in your mouth. Because you look around and you do not see very many senior women scientists. And that was the first time where I started, without really realizing it, to want to build a culture in which women can thrive. And he stopped harassing me uh, in what seemed to me at the time to be honestly magical circumstances. I know now that he was confronted independently because of harassment of another undergraduate. And at the time, it seemed to me that it had magically ceased. And he went on to write me a letter of recommendation. I was admitted because of my hard work and flawless grades to Harvard's PhD program in astronomy and astrophysics. I went on to discover new planets, including planets uh, with brand new techniques, which had never been applied before. And I uh, mentored Harvard College undergraduate women in science through the Harvard College Women's Center. I, I was on the leadership 
of the Harvard Graduate Women in Science and Engineering. And it was also uh, three years into my PhD program that I heard for the first time that this individual had harassed other people. This was five and a half years after the harassment had occurred. And I was learning for the first time that my experience was part of a pattern. And that shaped how I chose to behave when three and a half years later, there was a Title IX investigation of this professor. And I got to choose whether to share my testimony or not. Putting my experience in context and realizing that this pattern extended back more than a decade and included other women, I had to remember to be the woman that I needed then. I was vulnerable and junior, and I had difficulty getting the lay of the land to understand what my options even were. Now I could be that woman to protect younger me. And I chose to give my testimony in that Title IX investigation, and I can tell you that the university substantiated the claims of myself and, and three other women uh, who were complainants in that investigation. They concluded that this professor had acted in violation of Title IX, and they urged him not to do it again. And they said that the next time he offended, he might face suspension. Now, I'll explain why. Now, I chose to use my real name when the media um, made public the Title IX investigation findings. The first reason I chose to use my real name is because I had learned that when individuals actually know someone uh, who suffered, they tend to um, change their behavior. They tend to change their minds. And I thought, I have a privilege here where I have spent 10 years in the field of exoplanets. And when people think of Sarah Ballard, they think of exoplanets. And if I use my name right now, people will think, I know Sarah. She's a trustworthy and careful scientist. And I also did it to show other younger women that they didn't need to be afraid. And um, let me just conclude uh, by saying something I, I really would like to say, which is um, that I am committed to building this science culture from the ground uh, which doesn't only work for one kind of woman. And I want to say that I am not proportionally speaking the typical face uh, of a harassment uh, victim survivor. Actually, that is a woman of color. And women of color receive much less just outcomes than women astronomers. In fact, my community, my astronomy community, rallied behind me. Two dozen members of the faculty at UC Berkeley signed what was essentially a letter of no confidence and that professor resigned. So my community stood up and said, no more, not one more student. And women of color receive less than the justice that I received. And if I am going to build that science culture that works not only for one kind of woman, but for all kind of women, and indeed for all kind of people, then I need to look at how I too am complicit in a science culture which is decidedly unscientific. Uh, thank you.